Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar on nature-based therapeutics. My name is Molly Buss, and I'm the Community Relations Manager at the Earl E. Bakken Center for Spirituality and Healing, and my role for today's webinar is to help moderate the chat. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to give a quick introduction of the Bakken Center for those of you that may not be familiar with our work. It is our vision to advance the health and well-being of individuals, organizations, and communities through integrative health and healing. And in an effort to make our programming accessible during the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been hosting several of these free webinars and providing other online resources for you to take charge of your health and well-being. And I'll share some more information about those resources via email after the webinar concludes. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Mary Jo Kreitzer, founder and director of the Bakken Center. Um, but before I turn things over to Mary Jo, there's just a few logistical items I want to share with you to help navigate the webinar functions. Um, so you're welcome to share your thoughts and comments via the chat box. And if you're comfortable and want to share your responses with all participants, please make sure to update the to field in the chat box to all panelists and attendees. And you'll have the opportunity to minimize the chat box as well throughout the presentation. And we invite for you to do that during the components that aren't interactive to help you stay present. Um, there's also a Q&A a icon and we'd love for you to submit your questions there and Bakken Center Director Mary Jo Kreitzer will ask our presenter Jeannie Larson as many of your questions as we have time for at the end of the session. Um, if you're not able to find these icons, hover your mouse over the bottom of the webinar screen and they should pop up. As I shared, we'll be sending out an email after the webinar that includes a recording and other resources um, sometime later this afternoon. I'll now turn things over to Mary Jo, who will share a little bit more information about the Bakken Center and our presenter, Jean Larson. Well, thank you very much, Molly, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us for the webinar today on Nature Heals, an introduction to nature-based therapies. There is scientific evidence that being in nature or even viewing scenes of nature reduces anger, fear, stress, and increases pleasant feelings. Exposure to nature not only makes you feel better emotionally, it also contributes to your physical well being, reducing blood pressure, heart rate, muscle tension, and the production of stress hormones. In one study, 95% of those interviewed said that their mood improved after being outside, changing from depressed, stressed, and anxious to more calm and balanced. It's likely no surprise to many of you that during the COVID-19 pandemic, there's been a huge resurgence in gardening. And historically, it's a fact that in times of turbulence, Americans turn to gardening. Well, for some, it might be related to uh, worries about cost and the availability of groceries, but many have found reassurance and relaxation in the timeless ritual of planting, watering, and tending gardens. In today's webinar, Dr. Jean Larson, the Director of Nature-Based Therapeutics at the Bakken Center and the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum, will introduce you to the benefits and the science underlying nature-based interventions and explain the critical role of nature in self-care, community building, and planetary health. It's really my pleasure and honor um, to introduce our presenter, Dr. Jean Larson. Um, Jeannie began her work for the University of Minnesota in 1992, when she developed a partnership between the Bakken Center and the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. NBT, or Nature-Based Therapeutics, encompasses therapeutic horticulture, animal-assisted interventions such as therapy dogs or emotional support animals, facilitated green exercise, and therapeutic landscapes such as healing gardens. The partnership includes education of both University of Minnesota students and the community, research, and direct therapy services. 
Dr. Larson has a PhD in education with an emphasis in therapeutic recreation and a minor in integrative therapies from the University of Minnesota. At the Bakken Center, she teaches six courses, and I won't read the full titles of the courses, but they're courses in therapeutic horticulture, therapeutic landscape design, animals and healthcare, and introduction to nature-based therapies, and horses teacher. She is a certified therapeutic recreation specialist, a registered horticulture specialist, and has a certificate in disability services and administration with a specialization in serving people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Dr. Larson's work has taken her around the world from Japan, England, Austria, Sweden, Norway, Taiwan, Israel. And when not working at the university, Jeannie is at home enjoying her family farm north of the Twin Cities, along with her husband, dogs, cats, goats, chickens, and horses, or unplugged at their little cabin along the North Shore. So it's my pleasure now to turn this webinar over to Dr. Jean Larson. Thanks, Mary Jo. Be here. I'm gonna, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna turn myself off here so that we can look at the slides instead. So hi everybody, uh, it's great to be here and um, I'm looking forward to sharing, you, sharing with you some information uh, that I've been learning about for over 28 years. Um, so as Mary Jo mentioned, I have this shared appointment between the uh, Minnesota Landscape Arboretum and the Bakken Center, which is this uh, wonderful kind of cross-pollination between the practice and academics where each can inform the other. As I begin today, I wanted to just give you kind of a heads up of what I hope to be uh, sharing with you in the next few minutes. Um, we have this tagline called, a connection to nature is essential to human health and well-being. And what that means in the next few minutes is that we are connected to nature and there's science to uh, support that information. And you know, as well as I do, there's lots of ways to do that. But I wanted to first start off by making sure that we're all on the same page uh, when it comes to what the definition of nature is. And so for the purposes of today's webinar, we're defining nature as the natural world and nested ecosystems within it. This includes the non-built world made up of earth, air, water, plants, and animals. So basically anything humans have not touched. So this is a, a little different for me uh, working on a webinar. I usually do these presentations uh, with people close by sharing our uh, human energy. Um, so to try to make that connection with you, we're gonna start off just first off with a chat. Um, and if you could uh, just put into the chat uh, how you would define using this uh, definition of nature, how do you define nature's healing power as it relates to your own self-care. I'm curious to know how you've been accessing um, nature and what kinds of things that you do for your own self-care in nature. So if you wanna just take a minute here, don't think too much, just write down what comes to your mind and then um, we'll just take a moment and look at what you're writing down. So Jeannie, I'm noticing watching birds, um, Nature brings connectivity, tranquility, peace. People swim, they walk outdoors, they do nature photography, watch the sunrise in the morning, take walks, do bird watching, um, garden. So um, lots of the things that you're gonna be talking about today. Great. So if I were to summarize what you all have shared or are thinking about, I can safely say to you, that you need two things to experience nature's healing power. One <clears throat> is you need access to nature, and two, you need opportunities for engagement with nature. Nature's healing comes from our relationship starting hundreds of millions of years ago, and we have been evolving alongside and together with nature since. Over time, our memory from the co-evolutionary process has been stamped into our collective unconscious and remains in our DNA. I like how Richard Wagner puts it. If we were to consider evolution of life as a 30 minute film, 
you would see wave after wave of new species evolving, filling the environment with a diversity of life forms, then receding, sometimes totally, but occasionally leaving a few of the best adapted species behind. It is humbling to note that human existence on Earth would flash by in the last 3.5 seconds of the film with our mark on geological record one tenth of a second ago. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that really puts us in perspective. In fact, all of our coevolution makes us more similar than dissimilar to plants. When you think about our reproductive systems, we're similar that our genes divide and replicate. We both need sun to grow. And one thing I find really interesting is that our blood and chlorophyll are nearly identical, except for one atom. Plants need magnesium. We need iron. Nature's been around long before we were even born and has served as essential to our brain development as well as our physical, mental, and spiritual survival. So if our evolutionary home has been connected with nature, then what happened in the last one-tenth of a second in the film? I'm gonna tell you in the next few slides how we're still connected. And that connection has a name. It's called biophilia. Bio, nature, philia, love, our love of nature. Biophilia describes how we are intrinsically, intrinsically linked to nature and other forms of life. I like to think of our biophilia as the best in our human spirit because the opposite of biophilia is biophobia. Biophobia is our aversion to nature. It's how our ancestors survived nature's elements. Think toxic plants, poisonous snakes, Saber-toothed tigers. I'm curious how many of you flinched when you saw this snake coming up on the slide. No one taught you to flinch. That was something that has been gathered collectively from our ancestral knowledge. Our fear and anxiety has helped us sur to survive and because our brain and body are still processing fear and anxiety today as it did for our ancestors, these intuitive responses have evolved to make automatic life and death decisions for survival. We know from the science, our brains are hardwired for both a love of and fear of nature. Let me illustrate it this way. If you look at our brain within these three operational functions, you'll see we have the instinctual or the automatic part of our brain, the emotional, or what I'd like to think of as the expression of the instinct and the rationale or the executive part. Biophobia lies within our instinct and emotion. Biophilia can be found in our new brain where we can process thoughts. In other words, we may not be stressed by saber-toothed tigers anymore, but our brain and body still reacts as if it were. So what are some contemporary saber-toothed tigers? You fill in the blank but I would say COVID-19 is probably number one. We build our evidence in support of nature from two theoretical constructs, attention restoration theory and stress reduction theory. Attention restoration theory is about the cognitive benefits nature provides. That is, if our brains are in a state of directed attention, like you're doing right now, you're sitting in front of the desk and you're staring at a computer screen, over time, our ability to concentrate becomes depleted. But if we look at nature, we can restore our cognitive capacity. Brain overload equals mental fatigue with nature to the rescue. Essentially looking at, seeking out, or having an interest in nature is our involuntary attention engagement, which lets our brain rest and replenish. Stress reduction theory is not only cognitive restoration, but also physical. It is how we are predisposed to find non-threatening natural stimuli to relax, which in turn triggers our parasympathetic nervous system, reduces our blood pressure, slows down our heart rate, and relaxes our constricted muscles. In summary, nature is healing. I'm gonna jump into some of that evidence of how nature is healing, um, but I wanted to, again, ask you a couple of questions. The first is gonna be a poll, and the second is a chat. In the poll, I'm wondering, are you spending more, less, or about the same amount of time in nature now 
as you were before COVID-19. And in the chat, what kinds of nature-based activities have you been engaging in since COVID-19? So think about both of those things. More or less are about the same since COVID and what kinds of things specifically since COVID-19. And I'll just give um, people a couple more seconds here to answer the poll, but it looks like um, most answers have come in already. Um, and so right now about 59% um, are spending more time, 14% are um, spending less time, and about 27% are spending about the same amount of time. And Jeannie, I can tell you that the kinds of activities that people are engaged in include nature walks and scavenger hunts, hiking, biking, gardening, um, time with my dog, and I get a lot more walks, nature photography, biking, boating, more runs outdoors, many, many more walks, lots of walking, lots of walking. <laughs> I would say walking is the largest theme. Here yeah. someone has hammocking, um, they're spending some time doing. Um, hiking, quite a few people have talked about hiking, kayaking, um, spending time at the cabin. Um, so those are the major themes. So, some gardening, some yard work is also coming up. Um, and people, actually one person said, you know, that they have more time because they don't have to be commuting. And so that's really safe, giving them time, more time to be able to spend in nature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Quite a few people talk about um, parks and spending more time in parks. Somebody made a labyrinth. So I think that summarizes it pretty well. Great. So the reason why I'm asking you about your time engaged in nature since COVID-19, it's because the latest research is focusing on how nature serves as a community health intervention. And similar to all the things you just shared in the poll and chat, we're finding evidence to support this. For example, nature engagement enriches our senses and boosts our well-being by its colors, smells, and textures. Remember, our brains and bodies are still in the evolutionary garden, even though we are slaying emails instead of saber-toothed tigers. Research suggests our engagement with nature helps us to focus our attention to things that relax our mental fatigue, allowing us to be present in the moment. We know from the evidence spending time in nature resets our emotional clock and connects us back to the earth. This reconnection increases our understanding of seasonality, life and death cycles, and demonstrates cause and effect. Some of you talked about this. Science tells us access to nature is a great motivator to exercise, be it a run or a walk, whichever, in turn leads to better health. There's strong evidence that says when you grow your own food, you're more likely to be a thoughtful and aware of your own food choices. So better food choices means better diet, means better health. And if you're growing food in a community garden, there is no more diverse and politically powerful spaces possible. The act of occupying space and growing food together with people you would never normally meet breaks down barriers in real time. Another benefit about access to and engagement with nature is this connection leads to pro-social and pro-environmental attitudes. And I just want to add here that the most important thing that you can be doing right now for your garden and the earth is taking care of your soil. And I mean, not only in our backyards, but all the way through agriculture. Soil is the beginning and the end. Another thing we find from the evidence, access and engagement in nature brings people together. Being connected to nature connects us to one another. I'm gonna bring back this slide from the beginning and hopefully I've been able to share with you some understanding of how connection with nature is important to our health and well-being. But what if you don't have access or opportunities available to engage? Unfortunately, the research also tells us our connections to nature are unequally distributed by race, income, and age. For me, that's a big problem because nature is an equalizer it's a free and universal human right. 
So what if our effort to connect with nature, we do so at the expense of others? Not only is this deeply unjust, it is deeply hurtful to the fight against environmental destruction. Think about it, how can a child envision a world connected to nature if they have never had a chance to access or engage with it? I'm gonna end here with a quote from Paul Wellstone, we all do better when we all do better. And as we work to make nature free and universally accessible, we will be better people and we will leave a better planet for the next generation. Thank you. Well, Jeannie, I'm starting to see some questions um, come in. One person um, says, I would love to hear ideas for how to connect with nature in the winter, even when it's very cold. Mm. Great. I'm going to actually turn my video on. So um, will you still, I think you'll still be able to. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, great question. Uh, Minnesota does have its limitations in regard to being outside all, um, all year long, but I actually think of that as kind of a challenge, um, that it's really not about what the weather is doing, it's about how we prepare ourselves for the weather. So um, I think there's ways in which you can be outside in nature uh, if you are dressing appropriately and uh, getting yourself uh, bundled up and uh, the other thing about being out in nature in, in kind of uh, harsh conditions um, is it, for me, I just speak for myself here, but for me, it kind of puts me again in kind of perspective that, you know, we, we are not above nature. We are part of a whole system. We're all uh, interconnected and um, being, in, being in the weather and being in the cold helps me appreciate uh, my, my place within this whole system. Yeah. So Ginny, are there ideas that you have of, you know, things that people can actually do? Because actually several other people said winters, very harsh and gloomy here. What does one do? So developing an appreciation for it is certainly, um, you know, important. But other ideas of what people can do? Um, I mean, I've sometimes heard people say that, you know, that the key um, to you know, successfully adapting and living in a harsh, cold climate is finding something that you like to do. So whether it's walking or whether it's snowshoeing or skiing or something. Um, other ideas about that? Oh, somebody sure. put yak tracks plus bundling up. <laughs> yeah, well, it doesn't have to necessarily be outside either. I mean, uh, if you're really interested in kind of bringing nature into your own room, uh, you can have artificial lights and you can have, uh, our days are so short and our, our, uh, the UV light that gets into our, into our rooms can be somewhat compromised. And so having artificial lights to help you with plants and bringing more plants into your space uh, can be really helpful. Um, taking up some kind of a uh, a plant that uh, like something really simple to grow is lettuce. Um, it doesn't really need a lot of light. Um, you can simply uh, have little baby lettuce and, and cut that and use it into your food or you can uh, uh, have sprouts and uh, growing sprouts to add to nutrition to your food as well. Um, it's just even having uh, screensavers uh, of nature and having that be something that kind of lifts your spirit during the to, during the winter months. Um, a lot of the things that we do within our program might be around um, having some activities, art activities or kind of uh, crafting activities, DIY kinds of uh, activities that um, you can engage with. Um, I, I know for myself in the winter time, that's when we do stained glass making and things that require that we have a little bit more uh, time on our hands. Um, so that we can do some projects that are, take a little bit more time. So Jeannie, a couple of other things people said in the chat was um, spending time in the Coma Conservatory is a blessing in the dark winter months. Um, somebody says shoveling is oddly purposeful and therapeutic for me to, you know, to get outside. Um, some other people talked about YouTube videos that sometimes even a video that's only five minutes long. Um, somebody talked about um, find a way to stream BBC Spring Watch. 
It's amazing. And it would be awesome to binge that um, in January. So um, a few different ideas there. So um, somebody else um, asked if you can speak to um, Shinrin Yoku. And are there any certified paths near the metro? So first of all, maybe define what that is. Sure. So Shinrin Yoku is uh, the Japanese term uh, to describe being in the forest and being bathed by the essential oils uh, and the smells and the sensory experience of being in the forest. Um, Japan has these beautiful cypress forests and they are so fragrant and aromatic. Um, and so Shinrin Yoku is forest bathing. That's our equivalent term um, here. Uh, and we actually have uh, someone within the center who helps with nature-based therapeutics, uh, David Matzenbecker, um, who has taken the courses in California um, to become a registered uh, forest bathing uh, practitioner. Um, and I'm not actually, he would probably be able to address those specific questions about certified walks uh, and paths. I don't really know that. I just know that there are practitioners who lead the walks. Um, we have a practitioner out at the Arboretum, uh, Tom Benzik, uh, who leads forest bathing walks out at the Arboretum. Um, so I'm not familiar with certified pathways though. So I apologize, I apologize. those two would probably be better uh, experts on that. So um, this person asks if there is any research on the effect of looking at images of nature. Um, and said the images in your PowerPoint are very uplifting. Um, is, there, is there evidence that that can really make a difference? Yeah, actually um, that's some of the seminal research um, that Roger Ulrich uh, has done with the stress reduction theory. Um, of course the Kaplan's work with attention restoration theory um, is maybe a, 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 a tribute to that as well. Um, but yeah, Roger Ulrich's work, his seminal work was um, a really, I love his original work, which was looking at a brick wall at a hospital, uh, patients with gallbladder, uh, recovering from gallbladder surgery who looked at a brick wall, and the other half who were also recovering from gallbladder surgery who were looking out into nature. And um, this, this original research was talking about how um, the analgesic uh, painkillers were reduced when you're looking out at nature, the complaints were less, and even the length of time in the hospital were less. So yeah, I, I, we have that, um, like, I, like I was talking about the biophilic kind of connection to nature. And so when we're in a state of ill health, especially, or stressed, um, we find that we are drawn to nature or we're, uh, we, we want to have that soothing aspect um, of nature to to make us feel more calm and relaxed. Um, so yes, just having images of nature and you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, a lot of the hospitals uh, were kind of redesigning and rebuilding uh, units. And this was a big push to have these healing environments with um, nature images, real images of nature, um, like at Woodwinds Hospital, um, like preoperative images of nature that a person could be looking up at before they go into uh, surgery and after they come out, uh, having uh, images in the, the, the rooms, um, having curvilinear lines within the lobby areas and having natural kinds of elements within uh, the waiting areas. All these kinds of things are intuitively triggering our connection to nature and bringing that calm um, and restoration that we all long for. So Jeannie, I noticed in your slides, a couple of people have commented on the beauty of the slides. And some of those um, photo photographs are from Craig Blacklock, and he's a very renowned um, Minnesota nature photographer. And Craig is a senior fellow at the center. And so we've collaborated on a couple of things. And one of the things we've collaborated on is uh, as an app um, and in this nature-based app and it's called Wellscapes, 
um, you can go in and, um, it, and download um, five minutes of being in nature. And it's five minutes of exquisite video, you know, at different seasons. And you can have guided imagery turned on or off, music, nature sounds turned on or off. Um, but, you know, that, those are being used in a, in a number of ways, sometimes just personally, for people to take five minutes to, to you know, be immersed in nature. I love this next question because um, it's uh, on a lot of people's minds. If K-12 schools go virtual this fall, what can community members and organizations do to safely help support school children and their families um, with nature-based activities? And before turning that question over to Eugenie, I have to say that um, sh sheltering in place with me is my um, granddaughter who's seven years old. And she spends a lot of time in nature. And I'll just tell you two activities that she has done this week. One was making an art project with um, nature. And she actually made images of um, monarch butterflies by taking hosta leaves and flowers and kind of other things that she just kind of put together. And the other thing that I think is can be really successful with kids are nature scavenger hunts. Sometimes it's looking for objects. Sometimes it's looking for things like shapes. So there's so many things that can be done with children and families. And feel free to add things to the chat about that as well. But Jeannie, what tips would you have about that? Well, that's kind of an overwhelming question because it could be a webinar in and of itself. Um, a couple of things, I just want to shout out a couple of resources. We have the Children and Nature Network. Uh, Kathy Jordan is um, a fellow here at the Institute on the Environment and uh, she's a director at the Children Nature Network. Um, Richard Loof uh, is one of the founding members of that. Uh, and they have an amazing uh, resource, not only with regard to the research that's happening within this area, but they, they're now sending out every week uh, information about different ways in which you can engage with nature and your family while sheltering in space. So um, that I just want to give a shout out. And actually, Molly, maybe it's something that we can put in our resources afterward is the Children and Nature Network. Um, and another thing is our children education program at the Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. Um, we are now uh, creating uh, toolkits um, that families can uh, purchase uh, and their educational curriculum developed for at home with your, with your kids. Um, and so the Arboretum has uh, great resources in regard to that. Also, I just wanna say that on Friday, this Friday, first, um, we are reopening at the Arboretum. And so I encourage you, if uh, interested, to visit our, our Bee Center. Um, it's just a fabulous place to learn about pollinators, um, interactive uh, stations and that kind of a thing happening there. Um, and just being out as a family at the Arboretum, taking a picnic out there, uh, walking the trails, um, you know, over 1,500 acres of, of beauty. A, a new area that has just opened is this new um, access to one of the, the lakes and it's uh, part of the LCMR uh, project. So um, there's no development on this lake and um, it's towards the Apple House, if you're familiar with what I'm talking about. But anyway, um, lots of great things happening and it's, we're opening again on Friday. So Jeannie, a couple of other suggestions came in the chat. Um, um, one is a resource called Placed, Place-Based Learning that will lead to other resources connected specifically to nature and the environment. And um, the um, URL is www.edutopia.org. Um, and so um, it sounds like that is a fantastic um, uh, connection. Um, so keep, keep um, adding those things to the chat. Uh, lots of great ideas. Um, uh, Molly put in the Children in Nature Network that um, Jeannie just talked about. Um, so the next question I want to ask um, uh, Jeannie is about, you made comments about taking care of the soil. And several people ask, could you talk a little bit more about what are exactly are people supposed to do to be tending their soil? <laughs> Does that have to do with like not using pesticides? I mean, what does that have to, you know, specifically what things should people be doing? Well, I think probably the most simple thing is you can be adding, uh, uh, amending to your soil. Um, simple things like uh, 
if you have stinging nettle growing in your yard, which everybody thinks is a weed, actually stinging nettle is so rich in nutrients. Put on your gloves, long sleeve shirt, go harvest stinging nettle, and then make a tea, a stinging nettle tea, and then use that to fertilize your plants. Um, that, I mean, that in and of itself is, you know, a really simple thing that you can do. If you have willow um, around, willow is something that if you're um, looking to propagate plants, willow is a simple thing that you can be doing. You can be adding that to your soil as well. Compost, uh, uh, worm castings, um, I have horses, goats, sheep, chickens, you know, any kind of composted manure. Um, Soil, I, I, I guess I'm struggling because it's such a it's such an important thing. I mean, we we kind of take soil for granted, but all the microorganisms that are in the soil and the way in which soil structures itself, uh, we've kind of done things so backwards. We look, uh, we we till the soil. Well, actually, that's kind of like going in and putting a tornado into your house. It's just like you want to keep the soil as uh, structured as possible. Um, and so when you're planting, uh, not having to go back in there and rototill it all up, um, going in there and uh, just planting your plants and your seeds with uh, just a, a small, narrow way of uh, planting your seeds, um, trying to keep the composition of the soil steady and consistent um, structurally over time is really helpful for it because those microorganisms aren't being disturbed. Um, there's a whole new agricultural movement with uh, regenerative ag agriculture. Um, again, at the Arboretum, I just have to do a little plug here for the Arboretum. We have a whole new uh, exhibit with our, our farm uh, exhibit and we have uh, interpretive information about soil uh, restoration and um, regenerative uh, agriculture there at the, the new farm garden. Um, so I encourage you all to head out and check that out. It's this beautiful old farm uh, barn that has been restored um, and then information that goes way beyond the, the barn itself and it's out in the, um, the landscape as well. So uh, just a couple of ideas there. So Jeannie, in addition to the Arboretum, somebody reminded us about Oliver Kelly Farm, mm -hmm. and that is starting to reopen as well. So um, tapping into community-based resources um, is really a fantastic idea. So the next question, Jeannie, is can you say more about animal-assisted therapies? What are some examples of animal-assisted therapies, and how do people access them? Thank you so much for asking that question, because I really feel like this is kind of a a plant heavy <laughs> uh, presentation here. Um, animal assisted uh, interactions, I, I think of it as partnering with the domesticated animal as a co-therapist um, and working together um, to bring about some kind of measurable outcome. So for example, um, we have a program at the University of Minnesota called Petting Away Worries and Stress. This is a program where students can come and uh, interact with a variety of different uh, teams of animals, uh, uh, animals and their care providers. Um, gives students a chance to relax and uh, hang out with the animals and uh, just gives them a chance to um, uh, slow them, de-stress basically. Um, in our work at the Nature-Based Therapeutics, our Animal Assisted Interaction Program, um, we have specific teams that we work with, not just dogs, but we also work with uh, mini horse, um, and we work with uh, guinea pigs. Um, we have a therapy chicken that comes in and works with us as well. And so it's in the sense of uh, partnering with these animals and bringing about some kind of a specific kind of goal for the population that we're serving, which actually is what nature-based therapeutics in general is. Um, when we think about nature-based therapy, we're talking about the idea of nature as plants, animals, and nature. So it's kind of this buffet of options uh, for folks to engage with nature in purposeful or uh, meaningful kinds of uh, ways. For example, if I'm working with somebody who's recovering from a stroke, um, I might partner with a dog 
Um, and then that dog might be a way for that person to do their eye-hand coordination exercise or uh, maintaining their range of motion by brushing the dog. Um, ways in which that dog can partner with that person and myself as a therapist um, to benefit them. So Jeannie, a few people have asked about what some of your top um, favorite books are on this whole topic of nature and healing. Now, you mentioned um, Richard Louvre, and he originally, his first book was um, The Lost Child, Last Child in the Woods. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, his, his subsequent book was Nature Heals that you mentioned. Um, what, what are some of the other books that you really recommend people take a look at? Well, his other book was The Nature Principle, which actually I um, really uh, recommend that people look into. He has a new one out, Our Wild Calling, and actually in the animals and healthcare class that I teach, it, we used it as one of our uh, textbooks. So Our Wild Calling, and he's, um, again, kind of balancing that out. Uh, the Nature Principle talks more about the nature and plants, uh, forest air areas, but Our Wild Calling is really reinforcing uh, our connection uh, with animals. Um, there's a new book, uh, it's by Douglas Talame. It's called Nature's Best Hope. Um, and it talks about the things that we can do for conservation in our own backyards. That's one that I, uh, I strongly recommend. Uh, because for me, it's the connection to nature is just the beginning. The connection to nature is really about how ultimately, once we're connected, once we have that um, relationship with nature, and we find that we are benefiting from nature, then this, this stewardship and this care for nature is instilled. Um, it's called nature connectedness. And um, so this Nature's Best Hope is a book that I would strongly recommend because it is talking about that. The things that you can be doing for conservation that brings you that those healing benefits to your own self as you are engaged with nature, but then it also is helping um, support the biodiversity um, that we so desperately need. Um, instead of having all these little islands around the world, we need to have uh, this, these conservation efforts that are combined and creating uh, this, re reconnecting the system, I guess is a good way of saying it. So that would be one that I would recommend. Um, there's another book that uh, actually comes out of the UK, and it's this is a great one for families. It's called 360 Days Wild, and it gives you something to do every day with your kids out in nature. Um, and you know whether or not that's uh, in the summertime, uh, exploring and investigating a decaying log, or um, looking at how uh, the bees are pollinating a plant. It gives you uh, all sorts of different ideas on what you can be doing um, with your family 360 days a year. There are many, many other ones. I'm just trying to think what I have right here on my, my desk. Um, anyway, there's, there's many, many. <laughs> Those are just a couple of ideas. Sorry, there's just, there's just a load of them here and I'm trying to select them, it's too hard to do that in this moment. So Janie, another age um, uh, population, and that's vulnerable elderly people. Do you, have, do you have some ideas or suggestions on new initiatives to support um, vulnerable elderly spending time outdoors and in nature-based therapeutics? Mm -hmm. Well, right now it's really, really challenging because so many of our elders are sheltered and um, really not even able to come out of their rooms. And some, some, I mean, obviously some programs are, you know, allowing uh, more freedom and uh, movement within that. Uh, but just due to the vulnerability of our elders, um, that's something that's really difficult right now. One of the things that we're doing, um, because the the part of my work at the Arboretum is really about the practice and the application. We have um, some care communities that we work with. And one of the things that we're doing is we've created uh, websites and these websites uh, have daily modalities that um, 
daily modules, which include a variety of different modalities that people can do um, in their rooms um, to just learning, uh, stimulating their you know, intellect and their cognitive understanding of you know, Minnesota geology and you know, how Minnesota was formed and giving activities that can be done with the care providers in, in their room. So that's just one, you know, one thing that uh, we're doing um, in regard to helping just in this, this situation right now. Um, so Jeannie, any tips for dealing with eco grief and the gradual fragmentation of nature? That comes from the field of eco psychology and uh, I'm, I'm more of a generalist in that regard. Um, I wouldn't be able to address that in a way that I would feel like I, I would be doing it justice. Um, I can provide some resources that you could look into to get more help from that, but I don't feel comfortable talking about it because I don't really know enough about it. Okay. So if any of you have suggestions on that whole topic of eco grief and the threat to nature, you know, put it in the chat and maybe that's something we can add. While Molly has said she can't send out a transcript of the chat, we can call some of the resources that have been identified in the chat and um, send those um, um, out to you. Um, so uh, this is just a very quick question about the Arboretum. A lot of people have made comments, Jeannie, about how much they love the Arboretum. Um, somebody wants to know, are masks required at the Arboretum? Yes, yes. And the six foot distance is required out at the, um, the physical distance is required out at the Arboretum as well. Great. Um, any ideas about how we can help imprisoned um, people have access to nature? Is looking at photographs of nature the best we can do? Oh boy. Um, oh, there, there's a lot of uh, work within um, prisons and the idea of gardening and uh, kind of rebuilding vocational skills out in, uh, out in landscape uh, work. Um, my friend Mike Maddox in Wisconsin, he has a whole um, series of services within his uh, Master Gardener program, working with uh, incarcerated youth, mostly, um, and uh, folks who are in prison there. Um, you know, the whole idea of care farming, this is something that um, we didn't touch on, but uh, Care farming is the idea where you have some kind of a product that you're producing and then you're working with social service um, to benefit a given population. So for example, in Norway, uh, Scandinavia and Europe, care farming is you know, one of their cornerstone uh, social services where people, um, for example, might be raising heirloom sheep and then working with uh, social workers and having people who are clinically depressed participate on the farm and working with the uh, farmer and, um, and sheep and producing some kind of a fiber product. Um, and I, I think this is something that is growing within the prison population. This is something that uh, I think is is got potential to to take off. It's actually kind of uh, past his prologue. A lot of uh, prisons were farms, um, and of course there was lots of history around that um, that was not not good. Um, and but I think it's coming back in a, a more balanced and restorative way now. Well, Jeannie, I want to thank you so much for um, sharing all of your resources today. A few closing comments. Um, the center offers many academic courses about nature and well-being and will include links to these courses in the post-webinar email. You can also learn about the connection between nature and well-being on our Taking Charge website, which is a free online resource 
viewed by uh, about 250,000 um, people monthly uh, from all around the world. It has many examples of articles, videos with nature, environment, well-being experts, and some self-assessment so you can explore your relationship between um, nature and well-being. Just a quick reminder, this fall, the center will offer a three-part well-being series for planetary health. This free online series will explore the connections between the environment and human health, and will feature project drawdowns Catherine Wilkinson and Cloud Cult's Craig Minowa. So more information about this event is on our website. So thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, take care and stay well. Thank you.